All right. Happy Friday and welcome to the Future Focused Weekly Update, where I will be talking through this week. I've got three top of mind kind of headline topics that relate to the intersection of business technology and human experience. My goal is to keep these things uh, and just share perspective on what's going on in the world, what the implications might be, and just give you some food for thought about how we think about this stuff. Uh, this week, one of them comes from somebody who's been listening. So feel free to share them along as you do it. Otherwise, I will just pick some of the headlines that catch my attention this week. So for February 2nd, um, this week, there are three that I'll be talking about. And the first one is what's going on. There's a whole slew of data coming in about remote worker promotions. As you can imagine, a lot of people are thinking about you know, we're in that performance management season. And so people are thinking about promotions and what that means. And there's a bunch of data coming in. And I think you'll be surprised by, maybe you will, maybe you won't by some of the numbers that you see on this and what it means and what I think you can do about it, especially if you're a remote worker. The second one relates to a hot topic for a lot of people, which is this growing concern about job loss related to artificial intelligence. Is it real? Is it not? Where are we at? Should we all be wondering whether we're going to have a job in the next year or two? Is it something we should be paying no attention to? So I'll share a little bit about what some of the data and some of the reports are saying on this and also some thoughts on how we may think about it. And then the last one, if you did not see it this week, Neuralink made its official first inhuman implant. So we are one step closer to connecting people to machines. And I've got a whole bunch of mixed feelings on this one. So I will touch on that. So with that, what well, would keep this short and to the point, ideally, we'll see how far we go. But with that, let's transition over to number one, which is related to this worker, remote worker promotion. Now, promotions are tough in general. And over the years, I have coached and worked with a lot of people on what goes into getting promoted because there is a whole lot more to it. And it is a lot more complex than people often realize. It's not as simple as, you know, just keep your head down, do your job well, and eventually you'll get promoted. And so now you add remote work on top of that, and it adds a whole nother layer of complexity but some of the statistics that came out that I found extremely discouraging that I don't think should be there is, so first of all, one, if you are a remote worker, I've got some bad news for you. You are statistically 31% less likely to be promoted than your in-office counterparts. And if you think that number is a bit dismal, this tells you a little bit about where we are which is the other statistic that I came across was they surveyed 1,325 CEOs. And of that, 90%, nine out of 10 said that they openly acknowledged they are more likely to reward an employee who, and I didn't even like the phrase of this, who are willing to make an effort to come to the office. What? The, the question itself to me is biased because you're implying that an employee who makes an effort to come into the office somehow is working harder or put, so this just shows where we are from a stigmatization and just some of the biases we have around proximity and just what we think um, goes into this stuff. It really shows where we still are, which I think is unfortunate given some of the things that we've experienced over the past few years where so much of the workforce was disrupted. And you may think, well, Christopher, you're remote. Of course, you're going to be passionate about the remote worker thing. I actually have worked in an office before many times and have been fully in office. they have been hybrid, remote, whatever. To me, this is just straight up discrimination and bias, and it should not be acceptable. Now, that said, okay, and don't think that said means I'm going to justify it. I'm not. But like so many things, I understand the complexity that goes into this. And we often could look at this. You might be on one side of the camp. And I'm actually curious where people land. Because when I talk to people about this, I've encountered, <laughs> I've encountered that 90% who go, well, the people who are willing to make the sacrifice and get in their cars and show up to the office, they're more deserving of promotions, which I have words when I hear that, that I restrain myself from saying. So I know it's there, but I also understand that we're people. We're human. We have our biases. We have our preferences. 
of course we're more inclined to think positively of and have stronger feelings towards people who we have a physical relationship we see, we interact with on a regular basis. And to be fair, this is some hard feedback for a lot of remote workers. I know plenty of people who are not great at being visible, staying in front of people, you know, being present in the remote world. And so I understand where when you have a lot of people who are remote that you wouldn't even know they existed other than the fact they show up on a payroll report. I understand where that can lead to, well, out of sight, out of mind. I don't think that should be an excuse. And to leaders out there, I think we should be very consciously aware of this. You are missing a strong portion of your population, making an assumption that just because someone shows up to a building somehow makes them more promotable is discriminatory at best. At worst, it's just wrong. Um, so I think we need to be really careful. And if you are a leader, I think you need to be keenly aware. <clears throat> your peers are probably thinking like this. The people you encounter, many of them are thinking like this. So one of the first steps to overcoming these biases is to recognize that, hey, they exist, they're here, and we need to think about them. Um, because you have a lot of remote workers who are doing incredible work. And there are a lot of people who I know who are in an office that are wasting far more time than people. So you can't just use this as a binary in office is better than out of office. So again, very disappointed to see this. I would challenge leaders everywhere to do what you can to purge this bias. But again, it goes back to you need to define what good looks like. If you're going to tell, again, going back to promotions, and I think this is the root problem with this is a lot of organizations promote people based on liking them. And I hear it and I've heard it so many times through my career. Oh, this person's a rock star. But if you actually scratch the surface and go, what does that person do? And what are their capabilities that qualify them for a promotion? That's usually met with crickets. So all this to say, I think what we're seeing with this is actually less of a, wait, we should just put you know rules in place to make sure remote people get promoted. That's not going to be the solution. I think what the solution is, we need to focus as an organization more on performance and what actually defines good performance. And I know I have lots of conversations with people on my teams outside. Hey, if you want to be promoted, let's talk about what you do, how you're performing against that, and what promotion criteria look like so that we can set a threshold and say, if you meet these outcomes, then yes, you are promotion eligible. And one of those outcomes should not be makes an effort to come into the office. I'm sorry, I will stand right here and say that is a crap outcome to shoot for. And the fact in 2024, with all the technology and all the things we've experienced, we are still making that an outcome is disappointing to say the least. I'm going to end there because I will end up making a long form conversation just on this. So let's transition to some, what I would say more positive news on this. Lots of fear out there, lots going on around, are we going to lose jobs to AI? Do people need to be afraid of this? Um, what does it look like? And yes, is there massive disruption? If you've listened to any of my content or followed me for any length of period of time, you know that I'm a stark advocate that, yeah, disruption is here. It's coming. It's here. You need to be mindful of this. You need to pay attention to this or you are running a risk. That said, some of the data coming out, I was reading several articles on this. As it stands today, artificial intelligence is still more expensive to implement, to maintain, to use than it is to people. So yes, we could have a whole, I could do a whole podcast on nothing but all the other reasons why AI would be something you should caution before you just jump into, but let's just talk dollars and cents. From a purely dollars and cents standpoint, AI is still more expensive than human capital. So the good news for people who may be sitting here fearing, oh my goodness, my boss is going to fire me for chat GBT next week. Probably not anytime soon because financially, unless somebody is just making a foolish mistake, it will cost them more money to do this. Now, on a more entertaining note, I can't remember when I made this prediction, but I made this prediction a while back that I'm like, you just wait, this is going to happen. And I happened to come across a Wall Street Journal article 
that talked about the fact that there are a number of companies who invested heavily in robots. They filled their workforce with robots. They filled their warehouses. They filled all these different things. They had robots doing all sorts of work. And now those companies are going back going, uh-oh, we need to hire some people to handle the robots. <laughs> and I literally chuckled out loud as I read through this article because this is exactly the kind of thing for leaders who are thinking about this. Be so careful because if you just think, hey, this sound, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. If it if you're promised you can just hire this robot or implement this AI tool and you won't need as many people, be very careful because as many companies are finding out, you get what you pay for. And again, this is not bad news necessarily. Actually, reading some of the details, I did a little bit more digging into the companies that are at this state. It's not that they're regretting their decision to bring in robots. Actually, the robots are doing fantastic work. But like many analysts have predicted, it's creating new work that the robots need people to help assist them with. And it's stuff that they just can't do. And so what it's really doing, it goes back to, it's tangible examples of what I've been hearing and saying for a long time, that AI will, yes, there are certain things that will absolutely annihilate and they'll be gone and we won't, it will be, we'll laugh and go, can you believe a person ever did this thing? Yes, that will happen. But largely what it's going to do is create new and different things. And this was just a stark example of, hey, these companies went out, they spent a boatload of cash on robots, they populated things with it. And now turns out they need people, but to the job seekers who may hear this news and go, perfect, I can kick back, I can keep doing what I'm doing, I'm safe, AI is too expensive and ultimately it's a mistake and they're gonna need to keep people around anyway. I would not get too comfortable with that because in digging into these humans now that they're needing to hire to wrangle these robots and the tasks and the jobs they're doing, they are distinctly different than the tasks and jobs that the people formerly were in. So as these companies are reaching the state of maturity, yes, they're recognizing, hey, we actually need to bring more people in, but they're going not to do the same thing that we have the robots doing. They're not reneging on their decision to use robots for certain jobs and skills. What they're doing is recognizing, okay, now those are met, but this created new gaps that need to be filled by humans. So going back to what I have said time and time again, make sure you are keeping your skills current. You are looking at what is the next generation of things. I mean, the reality is I laugh, honestly, if you find some of these articles, they're pretty entertaining. Robots hysterically just, they don't handle the unexpected nearly as well as people. And that's not to say people handle the unexpected all that well. Um, I talk about that. <laughs> we don't always handle the gray space all that well, but we handle it a heck of a lot better than robots do. Aside, I saw a video the other day someone sent to me, and it was this person who figured out that sticking a traffic cone on the hood of a car just completely immobilizes the thing. An AI-driven car, it just can't function because it's been trained, don't hit cones, and it can't contextualize cone on the hood of a car it thinks it's just, you know, created a traffic accident and it just shuts down. So again, when you think about these things, as you think about companies going, hey, let's get AI and robots to do these things. Yeah, some of these robotic mechanical tasks that are repeatable, consistent. Yeah, robots are going to come in and do them. And so if you're in a job, be looking for those things in your work to go, hmm, okay, Maybe don't bet your chips on my unique value proposition to the company is my ability to perform these robotic mechanical tasks because that's going to get disrupted. And I have said on multiple occasions, 2024 is going to be the year that we are going to see this stuff pick up. We are past the initial kind of shock and awe stage of 2023. The tech has reached a state of maturity that now it's starting to specialize and companies are starting to implement on much larger scale. So keep an eye out, keep your skills sharp, start to de discombobulate and deconstruct the work you're doing and start to deprioritize how much effort you're putting into keeping your skills current around the mechanical stuff and be thinking about, hey, where is that really unique critical thinking, problem solving, things like that? Because 
there. But hopefully that's some good news to folks who may be on the panic train about what AI is going to do to the job market. And I don't know, anecdotally, this is totally anecdotally, I have noticed just from people who have either been out of work or in transition, and even just the number of things I get pinged about, the market seems to be picking up. I have a number of people who've been unemployed who have found jobs recently. I talked to a lot of recruiters. Things seem to be picking up. So I actually have a very positive outlook for 2024, but don't get too comfortable. Let's just close on that note. All right, last, but certainly not least. Ah, uh, this one popped up in my newsfeed this week. And then I got a couple messages about this one. So Musk and Neuralink successfully, air quotes, I'll do it on the video, air quotes, successfully implanted one of their chips into a human brain. And positive reports, all right, now, uh, depending on where you fall on this from an ethical standpoint and how far we go with it, um, you know, you may be either excited or terrified at this possibility. I would caution people from getting too amped up about the positive report. We're talking, we're two days into this. There is still anybody who's been in the healthcare space knows just because somebody makes it through day one or even week one, that is not a good indicator that something is a success in the healthcare space. Like you may be out of the woods. The person didn't die on the table. So I guess, depending on where you feel good news or horrible news, depending on where you land, but just because we're there, don't think, man, next week I'm going to be able to control the temperature in my house by simply thinking about, I'm a little too cold. And suddenly the thermostat goes up. We've got a ways to go. And just because it was a successful thing, you know, if you know anything about implants, putting things in your body that were not designed to be in your body and increases risk of infection. There's the bleeding that can come with this. So we're not out of the woods with this regardless of where you feel like we land on this. And one of the parts that I thought was entertaining and terrifying a little bit as I dug into this was just go ahead and do it. Google some of these things. You'll, you might cry or laugh. I'm not sure which one, but look at the sounds, look at some of the calls that they're putting out for volunteers for this. It literally sounds like it's straight out of a science fiction movie like promises to control your smartphone with your thoughts. I mean, they you're like, is this for real? Is this how we're really recruiting people into this? But it's real. It sounds like sci-fi and it's coming. And I said this, I don't remember when, uh, maybe it was earlier this year, but I said this, this is coming. It's moving faster than we anticipate. And it's very real. Now, again, when I say real, I think it's going to be interesting to watch this develop and see how well it works and how well it goes and what kind of real connections can we start to make between machines and human brains. But the people who are involved in this are not going to quit. And if I've watched the trajectory of society and mankind, it's, it's not a train that's going to stop. So train has left the station. It has arrived at the first you know, whatever station, and uh, it's going to continue down the track. So something I will continue to be watching, like I said, if you want to know where I stand on this, I've got mixed feelings. I think there's definitely lots of positive potential. I also have some serious concerns about the ethical risks and whether we really should even be going too far down this path. But again, still too early for me to call on this, other than the fact that it's happened it's real. It's coming. So if you were thinking, nah, we'll never do that. Well, this week proved it, proved that wrong. So with that, that is the latest in what is going on uh, at the intersection of business tech and human experience. If you come across things, you're curious, my thoughts or takes, I always enjoy doing this and engaging with people and hearing what's on their minds and sharing what my thoughts and reactions are to it. So message me, email me, send me a message on LinkedIn, whatever works best for you. I love when I receive those. So thank you to those of you who have contributed to it. Really appreciate it. And uh, that's all for this week. So I will be back next week with more. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your Friday and a fantastic weekend. See you on the other side.